Hello everyone, we are now in book 8 of the Gallic Wars, and it says continuation of Caesar's Gallic War ascribed to Aulus Hirithius. These freaking names are awesome. Preface. Prevailed on by our continuous solicitations, Balabas, I have engaged in a most difficult task, as my daily refusals appear to plead not my inability, but indolence as an excuse. I have compiled the continuation of the commentaries of our Caesar's war in Gaul, not indeed to be compared to his writings which either precede or follow them, and recently I have completed what he left imperfect after the transactions in Alexandria to the end, not indeed of the civil broils to which we see no issue, but of Caesar's life. I wish that those who may read them could know how unwillingly I undertook to write them. Why unwillingly? as then I might the more ready escape the imputation of folly and arrogance in presuming to intrude among Caesar's writings. Oh, he doesn't want them to think he's trying to, like, take on Caesar's glory. Okay, I get it. For it is agreed on all hands that no composition was ever executed with so great care that is not exceeded in elegance by these commentaries, which were published for the use of historians, that they might not want memoirs of such achievements. And they stand so high in the esteem of all men that historians seem rather deprived of than furnished with materials. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, you want to help them have something to read, look back on. Thank goodness, because I'm reading it now, literally thousands of years later. Thousand, hundred years later, right? What is that, like 16? Basically a long time ago. At which we have no more reason to be surprised than other men, for they can only appreciate the elegance and correctness with which he finished them. While we know that with ease and expedition, Caesar possessed not only an uncommon flow of language and elegance of style, but through knowledge of the method of conveying his ideas. See how he has to placate Caesar? It's like, don't chop my head off! <laughs> but I had not even the good fortune to share in the Alexandrian or African War. And though these were partly communicated to me by Caesar himself in conversation, wow, he got to talk with Caesar himself in conversations, yet we listen with a different degree of attention to those things which strike us with admiration by their novelty. That is so true. I do that too. And those which we design to attest to posterity. But in truth, whilst I urge every apology that I may not be compared to Caesar, I incur the charge of vanity by thinking it possible that I can, in the judgment of any one, be put in competition with him. Farewell. You're not vain, man. Come on. Be nice to yourself. Gaul being entirely reduced. Okay, now it's number one, okay? preface is over. When Caesar, having waged war incessantly during the former summer, wished to recruit his soldiers after so much fatigue by repose in winter quarters, news was brought to him that several states were simultaneously renewing their hostile intentions and forming combinations, oh boy, for which a probable reason was assigned, namely that the Gauls were convinced that they were not able to resist the Romans with any force they could collect in one place and hoped that if several states made war in different places at the same time, the Roman army would neither have aid, nor time, nor forces to prosecute them all. Nor ought any single state to decline any inconveniencies that might befall them, provided that by such delay the rest should be enabled to assert their liberty. That this notion might not be confirmed among the Gauls, Caesar left Marcus Antonius his quaestor, all right, his quaestor, in charge of his quarters, and set out himself with a guard of horse, the day before the calends of January, calends of January, from the town of Bribicate, to the thirteenth legion, which he had stationed in the country of the Baturges, not far from the territories of the Adui, and joined it to the eleventh legion, which was next it. Leaving two cohorts to guard the baggage, he leads the rest of his army into the most plentiful part of the country of the Baturges, who, possessing an extensive territory and several towns, were not to be deterred by a single legion quartered among them from making warlike preparation and forming combinations. I think the 13th legion was one of his most famous ones, if I remember correctly. By Caesar's sudden arrival, it happened that it necessarily must to an unprovided and dispersed people. 
that they were surprised by our horse what's well, cultivating the field without any apprehensions ah so people were working in the fields and they see caesar approaching and they're like what's going on before they had time to fly to their towns for the usual sign of an enemy invasion which is generally intimidated by the burning of their towns ah so an enemy invasion is generally intimidated to set everything aflame fire is the signal was forbidden by Caesar's orders, lest it he advance far, forage and corn should become scarce, or the enemy be warned by the fires to make their escape. Ah, so he's like, hey, don't uh, do the fires. We need to gather some corn, and we don't want that many people to leave. Don't want to give them a heads up this time. Many thousands being taken, as many of the Baturgis as were able to escape the first coming of the Romans, fled to neighboring states relying either on private friendship or public alliance private friendship or public alliance that's really interesting in vain for caesar by hastily marches anticipated them in every place nor did he allow any state legislature to consider the safety of others interesting strategy right there in preference to their own by this activity he both retained his friends in their loyalty and by fear, obliged the wavering to accept offers of peace. Ah, yes. Such offers being made to the Baturgis when they perceived that, through Caesar's clemency, an avenue was open to his friendship, and that the neighboring states had given hostages without incurring any punishment, and had been received under his protection. They did the name. Caesar promises his soldiers as reward for their labor and patience in cheerfully submitting to hardships. From the severity of the winter, the difficulty of the roads, the severity of the winter, dang, and in the intolerable cold. Wow, so it's so cold that if they're telling you it's intolerable, it must be pretty cold. Two hundred sesterci each, and to every centurion two thousand, to be given instead of plunder. And sending his legions back to quarters, he himself returned on the fortieth day to Bribicate, whilst he was dispensing justice there. The Paturgi sent ambassadors to him to entreat his aid against the Carnutes. Okay. So they want some help to take on the Carnutes, who they complain had made war against them. Upon this intelligence, though, he had not remained more than 18 days in winter quarters. He draws the 14th and 6th legion out of the quarters. So the 14th and 16th, no, and 6th are coming out. On the Seon, where he had posted them as mentioned in a former commentary to procure supplies of corn. Oh yeah, see, uh, what's his face? Cicero's with them. With these two legions, he marches in pursuit of the Carnutes. Oh, interesting. So he's gonna go take them on. When the news of the approach of our army reached the enemy, the Carnutes, terrified by the sufferings of other states, deserted their villages and towns, which were small buildings, raised in a hurry to meet the immediate necessity in which they lived to shelter themselves against the winter. For being lately conquered, they had lost several towns. So the Carnutes are living in these little shanty towns, essentially. They're not really so elaborate. They're just were kind of built in a hurry because it was cold. They have Caesar's on the way, and they're Audi. And dispersed and fled, Caesar unwilling to expose his soldiers to violent storms that break out, especially at that season, took up his quarters at Genabom, a town of the Carnutes and lodged his men in houses. Oh, that's interesting. So he's like, hey, don't let the men get too cold. Let's put them in these houses. Partly belonging to the Gauls and partly built to shelter the tents and hastily covered with thatch. But the horse and auxiliaries he sent to all parts which he was told the enemy had marched. And not without effect, as our men generally return loaded with booty. <laughs> They're returning with treasures. The Carnutes, overpowered by the severity of the winter, in the fear of danger, and not daring to continue long in any place, as they were driven from their houses, and not finding sufficient protection in the woods, from the violence of the storms, after losing a considerable number of men, dispersed and take refuge among the neighboring states. So it worked. He scattered them about. The Carnutes abandoned their little shanty village, and they're out of there. They're enduring uh, the cold and are really going out and all their possessions which they left behind which was very few uh, are taken what an interesting strategy Caesar has very interesting so the 14th and 6th legion helped take the village of the Carnutes 